Click the button. But Are I'm we like, live in front of people? I don't, I don't know yet. I just clicked a button. Doug, boy, you, officer, I don't know. Burr, burr, burr. I, uh, I do think I'm hearing some echo from someone. I don't know whom. I'm going to blame Justin. Likely. Um. Uh, well, here, I can turn Justin down. No, Justin, I will not go to the prom with you. Oh, no. Is that is that you typing? Uh, yeah, yes. Andrew? Okay. Type quieter. <laughs> yeah, no, it's like a like a little thunder, thunder rain. Fine. I'll move it into my lap. But the sound of it hitting my testicles might be even louder. Wait, wait, what? Yes, Brian, I'm the man with metal balls. I'm glad we got that out in the open. So, I got to hang out with a little bit Ben Ha, the I Can't Has Cheeseburger guy at this thing I've been doing. Oh, yeah? Oh, really? Really, he's done some great. I watched him do. He did a great talk in front of the kids about social media and just you know the, the you know just spread of memes, all that stuff. And then kids were asking him questions like, you know, what's the thing with like rape jokes in sloths, you know? And he did, you know, really really articulate, intelligent answer to all that. But uh, neat guy, neat guy. Right on. Uh, 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 oh, so but you know who I'm talking about he's the, yeah. he's the guy that owns that whole you know I can't has cheeseburger has and all cheese. those other yeah Uh, apparently when I click stream, I started sending to Twitch as well, which would be a mistake because they'll probably lose their crap about like, this isn't about Starcraft. Now I'll start running around smashing things like you guys are just, one of you just do this. <laughs> do what? <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, get it, get it, get it. Uh, uh, uh. I'll tell you what, it, it is like. Those that like those like co-op style torture games, like like it, you you could probably it would not be a, an impassable idea of just like you have to grab the mic, you know, and you have to like hit the buttons in a successive order enough times that it's just like a photorealistic torture game, like co-op. Uh, oh, what's this over here? I guess I'll restart the stream without Twitch. I don't know why. Did you 3D print that? No, these oh. are actually pop-up dinosaurs of course from the pop-ups they are. in that dinosaurs book. The moment I said that, I was like, of course they're not. They're going to be pop-ups. That's awesome. I have a home and a... Things. Uh, okay. So here, let me set levels. Check one, two, test, 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 checking. Uh, let me hear you, Justin. Check, check, check. One, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. You're coming in. I mean, I have you set at a decent level, but you sound clipped. I don't know if you're pushing out too much from where you are. How about now? Check, check, check. Keep talking. Hello, hello, hello. I am checking, sending, sending, checking, yeah, checking. Yeah, that sounds good. All right, and Andrew? Hi, I'm Andrew talking out my voice. La la la. I just woke up, so you know, give me a moment to. You uh, you do sound a little bit clipped, but I don't know if you have a mixer to turn it down from or set your input on. Mm, let's see what I can control here. Um. Um. Yeah, I can turn. Just, I lowered my, the input volume on my microphone. Try that again. Here you go. Keep talking. Hey, this is Andrew talking out my mouth hole. Yeah, that sounds much better. Test, 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 test. Run right on. Did it just You're on daily motion, by... Bray? 
Uh, what's that? You're on daily motion? Yeah, it should be on everything. Um, uh, Q&X Monkey says we're live on Meta, CDN, and daily motion. I stopped to restart it because I didn't want to get in trouble with the Twitch folks. They got to drop that gaming only shit like any second now, right? Like as big as they're becoming, uh, I mean, I know that they're big partly because of their brand focus on it, but to tell people, no, well, unless you're up, playing nice. a game, we don't want to see you. Well, I mean, like, that's the difference between Justin TV and Twitch, right? Like, Twitch is a big successful brand because it's only video games, and Justin TV was the exact same product without that that flavor on it, right? Yeah, but the natural order of things is to become successful in one category and then immediately diffuse your brand by capturing all the remaining market around it. And now that they're so number one that they flipped on top, I got to feel like they're going to they're gonna flip it around. Like, but I mean... It, but is there something to the idea of just create a different sort of channel, same thing, same everything, just so that is that is what you should do. However, that is not necessarily what pleases stockholders or or investors. Well, but I mean, they, if you have a state, but if it's still the same channel, I guess what I'm saying is like if internet, you know, brands like that are particular for Twitch, and then it becomes something else. Then you do run the risk of people going, the the users there are going, well, we're going to go elsewhere because we liked it when it was just us game stuff. Yes, and that is that is the right call. However, historically, nobody ever makes the right call. Cadillac becomes number one dominated luxury brand, so the first thing they do is figure out a way to sell a cheaper version of the Cadillac and diffuse their, their brand name. I mean, I, I agree with you guys. That is what they should do. However, the evidence is nobody does that. They always do the exact opposite, and I'm surprised that they haven't. I, I am assuming they will do just like everyone else does and diffuse their brand in order to uh, cash in on short-term brand value. Well, well yeah, I guess, like, I guess it's, that, that, it's, that's that's if they're not Google, right? Like, didn't like, weren't they getting bought I mean, by YouTube? Uh, Twitch? yes, yes, they are. Um, yeah, well, which to me only says even more that, like, if I'm if what what, what Google wants is dominant position in streaming google wants and so google it, gets a little man sorry <laughs> okay uh and and it's like uh, like if what they want to do is buy a dominant position i don't see why they would buy it and then not immediately pervert it into their we're now king of online streaming because we bought the number one spot and in that case i see no way that they're gonna keep it stuck just on gaming yeah I guess it would be a question of like whether or not there that push like Twitch kind of remains Twitch, but now it's Google's or YouTube's Twitch, right? Like, and then they just take that resources and they make like the the big everyone brand a a better, not crappy version mm -hmm. of YouTube Live, you know? Like, yeah. or if Hangouts are their big thing. I don't know. It seems like there's just like a million different ideas that float around at Google. And at some point there's a hunger game style competition and somebody wins, but it's like weird. <laughs> I have to apologize to fight for the ladder. There's not, there's not a ladder behind me. I apologize. <laughs> Do you know this old, this old ladder thing? No. So <laughs> there was a, uh, <laughs> I had a ladder when I was setting all this stuff up back there and it was sort of visible back behind the screen and at some point i took it outside and uh flying pop tart cat lost her shit man she uh she did not appreciate the ladder being removed from the scene and she swore this is like two weeks ago she swore like you have no idea how serious i am <laughs> i will never and so like <laughs> she had like a, i don't know like she changed her avatar to like never forget the ladder or something <laughs> <laughs> And her name's Fight for the Ladder and all this stuff. And also, she misspelled ladder the first time she wrote it, and so she owned that, too. <laughs> yeah, and so that's become... <laughs> Fight for the later. <laughs> Remember the former, never the latter. <laughs> all right, uh, I'm ready when you gentlemen are. All right, I just tweeted this out. Oh, yeah. Are we on the Diamond Clubs? We I sure as hell are. Yeah, yeah. What, what? <clears throat> Ready to go. Hold on, I'm about to oh, re tweet. Retweet. All right, and we are live. And count me in. I'm ready. 
Boys and girls, oh, wait, wait, children wait, wait. of all that's, ages. That, that's not counting. That's just starting. Count, count me in and I'll hit start. I'm about to begin my countdown. <laughs> Boys and girls, children of all ages, welcome to the Weird Things Podcast with Mr. Brian Brushwood. Oh, man, I knew it. I, I brought that cup up to my mouth, and I thought, I'm summoning the gin to call upon me. <laughs> so, I waited. I, w- I wait to see Justin Robert Young. <laughs> oh, God. Geez. Oh, man, I had a cup to my lips, too. Do I wait, wait uh, to see where the cup goes to is the it, lips. Did, did, did you get an them. intentionally complimentary color to your red plastic cup here? No, we actually just bought red cups but uh, like <laughs> uh, when, when we first moved in. So this is totally... This uh, is amazing, though. We look like, uh, like Wonder Twins here. Or the Vision. <laughs> mm-hmm. That's right. Yeah, the green and red, huh? So the, the man you hear trying to speak as liquid trickles down his chin is Brian Brushwood. The man who has the wonderful strainer beard to capture said liquid is Justin Robert Young. Hey, man. It's amazing what gets caught in there, man. Like, it's liquids, dust, solids, animals. Like, it, it's amazing what you find in there. I found a doubloon yesterday. It was, it was, just, it was a great find. I found a balloon. Uh, <laughs> a balloon. Well, Where? gentlemen. I want to jump right into it. Speaking of finding things. Uh-oh. Yeah. I'm going to jump right in and tell you right now. Goblin. Okay. Goblin. <laughs> wow. No burying the lead on this one. Uh, oh, no. We go There's full a lead frontal here. goblin it's... today on weird things. <laughs> uh. So periodically, we like to cover one of the biggest problems facing people in third world countries, and that is being terrorized by goblins. It really is. Yeah. Um, and we've realized through our research that these may be actually uh, cries for help and perhaps evidence that there is some sort of horrific sexual abuse going, being taken place through maybe people using pharmaceuticals, et cetera, that cause yeah. weird hallucinations. Or maybe. it could be goblins. I mean, I'm just, just let's not throw the baby out with the goblins. Sure that. I mean, you're right. It is, on one hand... Thinly veiled metaphor, so the word can at least get out that horrifying things are happening. Yes. Or goblins. <laughs> so, I, I I pick up stories when I find some interesting little twists, etc., like that. Um, there there are quite a lot of goblin stories out there, and and, and there seem to be a lot of like terrorizing girl schools for something. But this is a different one. Um, so, and, and talk about, like, we had, there was a thing a couple of weeks ago, some teachers threatened to quit their school district because of uh, goblins in the workplace. And I'm thinking, like, if the teachers union here are looking for a new angle. Oh, dude. Yeah. Imagine that. Like, the big uh, Chicago teachers worker strike, you know, and, and uh, Rahm Emanuel's like, hey, we need to do this certain stuff. And then the teachers are like, there's goblins in there and they're raping <laughs> <Goblins>. people. <laughs> And then the, the new thing is like, look, we got look, uh, everyone knows there's a goblin problem. I think the goblin should have to register. I think uh, if you see a goblin, if you see a goblin, say a goblin. Come on. I think it's about time that we understand that the goblins need a pathway to human citizenship. <laughs> Look, they didn't come over here just because they love terrorizing children. Uh, it's even worse over in Goblinton. <laughs> so, new goblin twist. A uh, woman by the name of uh, Matsushita. By the way, a, a great Ueda. Chubby Checkers song. <laughs> the Goblin uh, Twist. Let's twist, let's twist yes. again. The Goblin Twist, and then the new Goblin Twist, which uh, which was really at the end of the rope. What, what what really sucked is when he got together with the Fat Boys and started rapping over the Goblin Twist. <laughs> like that was that was unnecessary. That was just cashing in. Uh, all right, I, I'm so excited. This the Goblin, the ever expanding Goblin story is, is, right. is really my favorite thing. So what what is new? So there's there's I'm I'm gonna keep going, and then there's gonna be a funny little bit of touchback right here. Uh, so 44 year old Matusita Loeda says her family's been terrified of a of a short tokolesh, which they describe as a goblin. Um, it's been haunting the family, or the evil creature has haunted them for 14 years. She says, after I accessed my ancestral calling to be a Sangoma, the Tokoleshi became very aggressive. I don't know what that means. Maybe something religious. Um, and it says it choked her sleeping husband this Tuesday. They had to shake him to wake him. Now she said she and her husband share their bedroom with six kids, with their six kids. 
we sleep together so we can shake each other when it chokes one of us. Uh, she said that the three-year-old used to say she was playing at night with a nana none of them could see. Another child. That's another child none of them could see. When she played and the dog barked, we knew the Tokolesh, their goblin, was around. Now she cries when it's around. And it's understanding. We've had to, after several of these stories, we realized that goblin there kind of meant ghost. Yeah. Um, but a much more physical ghost. Uh, so anyhow, now the little girl cries when it's around. Her son, 22, moved from the backyard shack into the family house after he said the goblin attacked him. When I fell asleep, it whispered into my ear and slapped me. I couldn't understand what the big voice was saying. His sister named Beauty says its footsteps are heavy. I've heard it roar at night in our bedroom window. Um, they said they've had four traditional healers, but they are no match for the monster. They told me my strong ancestors to protect my family because my kids would have been dead by now. I'm looking for a very strong Sangloma to enter misery. All right, misery. Uh, j- just so I can get the right um, uh, wrap around my mind around the culture. This is what part of the world this is in? Uh, this, I think, is South Africa, I believe. Okay. And, uh, uh did, is goblin just a catch-all term? Or, you know, we mentioned that it, that it's similar to ghost, or it's like, like, a like, uh, you know, here, here in the United States, we tend to separate different physical medium. If it's, if it scares you in the forest, it must be a chupacabra or a Sasquatch or a Yeti or whatever. If it scares yeah, you in the cryptid. bedroom... It must yeah, be a this, ghost. This one, this is from Zimbabwe, so Southern Africa, but not South Africa. Um, yeah, and so it seems to me ghost or spirit or something like that, and sometimes maybe being possessed. But this goblin, there's something special about this goblin. I had to read through here in, in my own monotone voice and take out certain elements to describe this goblin. Oh, uh, yeah. Have we heard the filtered version so far? Or that was the filtered version. Okay. All right. Can, can we well, hear? Let's the... also understand that, like, just the one guy, the 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 twenty something year old who's like living in a shack out back, and it's like, like I don't know what happened with all these other goblet stories, but I'm sure as soon as they all started happening, the guy who's living in the shack is like, no, the goblin got me. I gotta move into the house now. <laughs> uh all right so what i mean did you want us to guess what you've left out andrew uh yeah they've described the goblin i left out the actual description of the goblin he's white Mm, wears a green Mm. hat blue (laughs) shirt moon on it sends his kids to horse camp (laughs) <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't even have anywhere else to go with that. <laughs> um, uh, <laughs> no guesses, no guesses. Well, okay, no, all right, all right, all right. I'll say, I'll say, um, let's let's go traditional. What I would think of as a goblin, so uh, green, uh, craggy skin, pointy ears. See, I feel like I spindly f- fingers. Feel like the thing that. Andrew left out has to spell out the actual thing of what it is, right? So no, no. Oh, this time. great. Oh, good. All right. Well, in that case, I got nothing then. Uh, um, let's go. Uh, uh, Uzi pours. Um, <laughs> a, uh, a a springs for legs. A face made of cardboard. Um, but a gorgeous voice. Like, just sounds like heaven when he sings. He comes in singing Moon River on his little uh, ukulele, <laughs> strolling, you know, floating down the South African rivers. It's the most beautiful thing you've ever heard. Those famous South African rivers. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to do a Google search here because there's a wonderful description of what they say. And I'm trying to think of, like, can I find an actual example of this? Because so much may be lost in cultural translation. Um, and, and there was a reason I jumped all over this cause I said, I, I've got it. I, I need to find out more about this. This is fascinating to me. And I think I may have solved a mystery too. I don't want to brag. Um, so they described the goblin as the headline is goblin dressed like rock star to terrorize his family. This is amazing. It's David what? Bowie. David Bowie is the goblin. Or maybe David Lee Roth, because let me get you into the description of what he's wearing. Okay? <laughs> all right. All right. The family says they're terrorized by a goblin that looks like a rock yard. Apparently, it has green eyes and wears a 1980s yellow suit with black stripes and a cross belt. 
So right, now, keep in mind, keep in mind the they've ad. also they've also described Bruce Lee and uh, the chick from Kill Bill. So it's True like that. you got a lot of different places. It's the height of a three year old child, but as the face of a grown man. So as they're describing so this, like David Lee Roth. <laughs> yeah, it's, I'm thinking, it, it's it's maybe it is David Lee Roth. But can you imagine maybe, the last, you kids. <laughs> maybe he does he, rock. he pops Get in he pops in with his jawbone jam box and hits play <laughs> and he's all Panama <laughs> Panama oh, 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 oh. I used to be in Van Halen I just like like the 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 the, the, the hot for teacher like riff like <laughs> Walking through the South African <laughs> house, looking to cut up some kids. Oh my God. <laughs> oh You're going to get ready to shake your sister because they really rock the goblins here. <laughs> Hop for goblin. Dun, 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 Guys, I may have this all wrong. What? What? Totally wrong. What are you talking yeah. about? Yeah. Yeah. Brian, I'm going to send you some new data here. Uh oh, here um, it comes. It, it is, it is, it's an embarrassing mistake to make, but it can happen. All right, here we go. Steven Tyler. I'm looking at his description: the striping, the yellow suit. Hmm. Uh, let's take a look here. Um, <laughs> all right, update for the video watchers. I think we have an artist's composition of what we think. Uh, <laughs> oh, no! <laughs> all right. So, so uh, by the way, as if, as if, I don't know, it's eerily accurate, but uh, if you look at Sammy Hagar in I Can't Drive 55, as uh, Andrew has just sent over to me, first of all, if I'm not mistaken, that's either Spiro or The Fudge. Right yeah. next to capturing Sammy Hagar as a goblin, uh, come Willy Wonka reject. You know what? I may be wrong on that. There could be more of them too. What? Oh, Hold on. So I hear. By the way, yeah. If Breaking you want news, to ladies Sammy and gentlemen. Sammy Hagar can drive fifty-five. Look at his out uh, outfit there. That is a yellow uh, shirt. But no. How about this striper <laughs> Christian <laughs> metal band? <laughs> Man, there's a there's a lot of apparently apparently all it takes is a yellow jumpsuit to make the cross from '80s hairband icon to uh, goblin. I just I just like I remember like in the UFO stories when the ha people have the encounter, they go there and they show them like pictures of grays and different ones. Like point this out, I'd like to go there with like a bunch of '80s record albums, you know? And can you point them out? Which just one see, was yeah, it? yeah. Which which of these was the band that touched you in your heart with their sweet so, uh, ballads? Uh, yeah, so go look up Striper. That's that. You look up Striper, and that's with a Y. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of David Bo. Oh, 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 boy. oh boy. <laughs> Here it goes, oh. ladies and gentlemen. We are anticipating breaking news here. Yeah, breaking at news. As we try to settle now. this case. Maybe, maybe it is. Oh, the this just in, all. ladies and gentlemen. Uh, yeah. We have yet another artist of composition. And, and, and of course, to, to recap, so we had we had uh, David Lee Roth. We had Sammy Hagar. Right now, hey, I'm a goblin. <laughs> but here, there's the man himself, David Bowie. Stripe what what fans, you said, the height of a child, blazer. the height of a child with the face of an adult, right? Well, he's he's a pretty tall guy, but yeah, you know, he's very compelling. Also, take a look at this. I'm gonna drop the uh, take a look down by his feet, and what do you see there? Oh, what? a little baby <laughs> doll. One he's of his just, he's just toying with us now. <laughs> he's been a goblin all along. <laughs> Maybe that's him in the middle of transitioning. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. Oh, oh wait. Uh, you guys, it's looking more and more like Bowie. <laughs> okay. Oh, like, no. Once again, One breaking news here on the Weird Things podcast. As Brian and Justin... Uh, continue to oh my Fly god! Fly to Zimbabwe, Dang. I'll visit you tonight. <laughs> wow. wow! So there you have it, ladies and gentlemen. David Bowie QED. is terrorizing people in Africa. <laughs> QED. That wow. might be the most British photo I've ever seen of how? anybody, let alone David Bowie. Well, and, and explain so to me. British. Explain to me how on earth he had uh, he has grandma hands. When was this taken? Look at look at that. 
Uh, because he weighs about forty pounds in that photo. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Grandma hands. Yeah. All right. So oh, yeah. rock like star he, he goblin his pants are hanging off him. People in Zimbabwe. All right, here, uh, Andrew. What 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 were the search terms you used? Uh, so people who <laughs> are listening. That's what I, that's what I want to know. Is like how he kept finding these. Did you just type in rock star yellow? <laughs> yeah, I typed in like uh, yellow suit, rock. And then I remembered, and then uh, I looked for David Lee Roth, and one just popped up. And then I typed in, I'm thinking, maybe it could have been Sammy Hagar. So I just, Sammy Hagar can't drive 55. Do you realize, you realize in this um, photo, Dave, uh, David yeah. Bowie has uh, Conan O'Brien's hairstyle, like down to the color. He does. And in fact, he... And, and he has the, 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 the face of the older brother from Pete and Pete after a meth bender. <laughs> oh <my God. laughs> How did he ever get a reputation as being beautiful? I think because he is Bowie is a beautiful man. I think this is Bowie probably maybe in his very very party phase, thin phase. You know, mm. I mean he he looks extremely thin there, ridiculously thin there. Yeah, grandma hands. <laughs> uh, th- no more. This is a breakthrough, Andrew. I feel like uh, mm-hmm. you know we 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 focus so much. On, on what rock stars could do for Africa. And now we find out that it really is this hidden <laughs> torment that they it's are Af- trying The to, question to is now what for. Africa can do for rock stars and apparently give them a second chance and a second bite at the apple by coming back and uh, rocking out people in the middle of the nights. Yeah. Gentlemen, so, ready to change the topic. I mean, topic. probably a molester, though. <laughs> <laughs> like, I mean, it's probably not David Bowie as a, rock, as a goblin. It's probably a molester. Way to, way, to, way to just pull back the curtain on that, Justin. We had a, we had a whole vision here happening. You're like, no, but seriously, it's a, it's a molester. I mean, odds on. The old... <laughs> All right, All right <laughs> gentlemen. Um, how would you like to work in a scientific lab? Oh, are you kidding me? I could feel, like, smart and see important stuff. How would you like to maybe like do some important work saving the world from infectious diseases? I want to, for those of you listening, you could hear the sound of my heart going up into my throat and then sinking to the bottom of my stomach as I realized where this scenario might be going. All I'm saying is there's some people who have to be on the front lines and they're saving sure. us. Sure. But you know what? I'm going to put you in like a low security lab, okay? Your low security lab, right? I mean, yeah, barely what? any security, bro. I okay, <laughs> security is not the first place I went to. I, I'm here to help with the cause. I mean, would you so, like so a lot? There of you are, you guys are cleaning pipettes. Okay, you know? yeah. cleaning, working in a lab, right on, dude. Doing do, doing pipettes, you know, getting that Best stuff. Best way clean. to roll it, man. Where my pipettes at? <laughs> I'm yeah. cleaning them. Simple stuff, you know, whatever. And then, okay, oh, hey, hey guys, you know what? I'm, I'm going to send you guys a present. Y'all got a present. You ready for your present? Uh, yeah, mm-hmm. Sure, sure. We're just cleaning yeah. pipettes. So you're yeah. like, hey, you know, this is job's kind of cool. We're not like the guys down in the basement, the secure facility working with like Ebola and smallpox, stuff like that. And like, and they're like, you guys get like a, a shipment from below. And they're like, here you go, guys. And you're like, that's cool. Because like, we don't work with the dangerous stuff. We didn't sign up for that, right? Yeah. Hey, man, look around. How much security do you see? Very Minimal. little. That was Minimal our deal. Security. Minimal security. Dude. But you, know, you want to know what you do see? Some clean-ass pipettes. Oh, my God. Yes. Uh, Dude, check out this flask. Erlenmeyer. Erlenmeyer flask. Clean. Dude, old old Ray Erlenmeyer himself would look at that flask and be like, that is clean as you see hell. This, you see this Bunsen burner? I don't know. It's it's got fire in a tube Dude, on it. Tyrone Bunsen himself <laughs> would look at that burner and be like, "Clean." So See this clean. dish? This is a petri dish. Yeah, I don't even. I bet you don't even know Rob Petrie. Dude, yeah. So Rob and his wife Eileen guys, Petrie, who co-invented the dish, would say clean as hell. So you guys are having discussions about this. You're talking about Game of Thrones, and maybe somebody will bring up some science stuff like, ah, shouldn't we destroy smallpox? You know, that's a big debate right now. Like, we've completely just about eradicated it. We've eradicated it from people. We have the last remaining samples are in laboratories. And we're like, should we just destroy them, you know? Uh, yeah, well, first of all, no, because you never know when you're not, you might need it. I mean, just keep it locked up, I guess. And then we, we could right. beat it again that's if it gets fault. out. 
Um, so Justin, what's your thought on that? Um, I re- restate the question. I got should lost. We, oh, you know, you guys are talking about should we destroy smallpox? Yeah, we we only got a little bits and pieces of it in some labs everywhere. It's pretty much gone from the oh, world. Oh yeah, so it would it would never it would never be around again. No, you got to keep it. Yeah, okay. just in case it gets out. Dude, I don't want to be accused of being on like genetic uh, hoarders, but like okay. you never know. This... So are you comfortable that we'd be able to securely keep track of this stuff? I mean, give or take, sure. I mean, it's like. Okay. It's not like How hard friends. is it? Hit, you hit, put it on a piece of paper. Box, Justin, to put on the shelf over there. Uh, wait. I'm sorry. What? Would you hand Justin the box that just came in from receiving? Well, to yeah. No, I mean, if, if, here in our low security lab, we're okay. all bros. So keep going. Here, so you're all for let's this. keep the smallpox around. All yeah. right, that's fantastic. What's where's it gonna oh go? Oh my god, that white powder is anthrax, and it was supposed to be deactivated before we sent it to you guys. Oops, we just in, potentially infected 75 CDC employees with anthrax ourselves um all right well this sucks but at least i don't have smallpox <laughs> yes oh, although it does thing. continue our musical tribute for weird things as now <laughs> anthrax has come into position <laughs> so 75 employees at the cdc may have been exposed to anthrax because apparently they had to do some research on it they will do the inactivate basically kill it right yeah well they received a bunch of math some well, not a bunch for a little vial of anthrax had been deactivated. The numbers got up. Now they think 86 employees may have been exposed to live anthrax. Now, when how do they deactivate anthrax? Do they like irradiate it and keep it in powdered form, or what's the story with that? Um, I think probably I'd imagine probably use some sort of radiation or something like that. Uh, uh, a friend of mine did his uh, PhD on uh, powder dispersal. Like, this is a weird thing that you wouldn't think would be there would be room for it in a PhD. But he's a guy who has a background. Like, he, I forget. He did the Trinity. Like, he, he got his undergrad, his master's, and then his PhD, each in a different of the, the WMD categories. Like, uh, like biology, uh, uh, radi- radiation, and, uh, and, and chemistry. And uh, for his PhD, though, he, he wanted to study, uh, you know, thinking that it would be of use to the military or to whoever, the idea that once a powder disperses, you know, because there's all things you have to consider is like the, the, the turbulent nature of how it disperses, how sticky, whether it sticks with, uh, um, what do you call it, uh, you know, static electricity or, or by barbs on the actual powders themselves. And he basically spent all this time de- building devices and that that would blow various types of powders at you know your linoleums you know because the question is how do you clean it you can't just run in with a vacuum give it a couple of blows on a carpet and be all like oh, i'm sure it's all up there go ahead move back in so well, so what happened here is that they they have like in the level three lab where they have the full-on thick spacesuit type stuff to work with them they have it and they were sending it to another lab where it's supposed to be deactivated and somebody went to go throw out some slides some microscope slides that they'd used to look at it and they noticed it had been growing on there and this was supposed to be the dead bacterium the anthrax had been killed and it hadn't been killed and they're like well 86 people had been around and exposed to this and not using the precautions you would normally use so far no reports of fatalities or injuries they're able to you know if they do show signs they can give them antibiotics they'll get really good treatment and hopefully nobody get hurt but it was a procedural error it was just it, it, so, somebody marked it deactivated and it wasn't. And Before we get into how safe we all feel keeping these kind of things and putting them in the hands of our, our fallible human you know, brains, like if you were working at the CDC, even in a general capacity that you are not expected to be on like total medical lockdown for really, really rough stuff and you get anthrax because of this, how much is there the feeling of like, yo, man, I work at the CDC. Like, you know, if you work at McDonald's and even if you're not on the fry later, if you're the one taking money, sometimes you might get splashed with hot oil because there's a hot oil machine right next right. to it. I mean, I'm sure they have all kinds of uh, paperwork when you come in to, to work with that. So they got some kind of, you know, plus also, I mean, you're talking about the same institution that sends people with the stated objective of dying on foreign territory. You know, it's like like when you work for the government, I think there's a built in expectation that the rules are just a little bit different. Right. Yeah, well, I think, you know, hospitals, you know, you're going to be in medical environments, you know, you're going to be exposed to things that you're not going to be elsewhere. And I think there's a certain amount of risk. And, you know, it's just I just use this as an example. I'm like, I don't know the answer. to. The, I mean, the, here's 
eliminating smallpox is off is off also kind of an example of the gun control debate because you could say like all right let's get rid of smallpox so it's never there okay how do we know the russians got rid of it yeah uh i how don't do trust the russians it? to i mean like we find like paintings from old masters at flea markets like like who knows that we've gave, we've like accurately kept track of every stitch of some disease yeah oh I, yeah and we've had and we've had instances where we thought it was completely gone and then we find it again so it, it, but anyhow but also this shows you procedurally that these are the smartest most since and as cdc's these people have saved countless millions of lives through their efforts and these people are doing heroic work they are brilliant people they are doing great work accidents happen in this case it affects them internally and that's just that the realization of it no protocol can be perfect if human intervention can screw it up merry christmas well and, and plus that's- also like like we've seen this from like uh going back to like the 1920s when they uh when the zener esp experience uh experiments were happening right and and they would uh you know, the question was, how much human error can there be in the testing protocol? And uh, it wasn't his group, but there was some other group that just said, here are the results. All you have to do is write them down. And they noticed that there's a human bias. Like if they believed in ESP, they would tend to make mistakes that, that would generate more hits than misses versus somebody who is skeptical. So it's like the moment a human touches it, there's something that's going to mess it up. And that, I assume that's universal. So another place that we could be finding we could get rid of the smallpox is they think that frozen mummies and envelopes of scabs could contain remnants of smallpox. Envelopes of scabs? That is the most metal name I've ever heard. It's my newest band, Justin. (laughs) So they had some workers in 2011 were digging a foundation at a site in Queens and their equipment struck against something metal. Then a body rolled out of the rubble, thinking they might have nerfed a shallow grave of the murder victim. They immediately called the New York chief medical examiner. Um, they find out this was person was probably uh, buried in a nearby church. But if, again, the CDC comes in because there's a potential for infection. There is a potential that you could have bacterial agents and viral agents and other things that might be able to stay dormant for considerable amounts of time. And so that's another factor is that we could get rid of it and then it could pop up somewhere else. I mean, that is the thing right there where it's like uh, once once you think about it as, you know, as a tactical advantage to have the important materiel and, and there's not a biological arms race happening right now. But certainly it seems like being well armed with, you know, the potential to defend would be a good idea. Right. I agree. And also label. Let's label it twice. I propose a two times labeling solution in which you label it once and then you label it again. And so it's to prevent so, confusion. But there then also go. put your initials on there and maybe the date. You know, we'll just say put down the date two and, yeah. uh, and an XOXO on Here's there. Here's the thing. Let's even go one step further. Try your favorite animal. You know what? Let's go a step farther. On all the passwords, just to be safe, let's add a one at the end. So yeah. whatever the password was, new password is that plus a one. Password at the one. End. Yeah. That's so, my password. So I think it's apparently when people would find some sort of mysterious or what they thought was smallpox or something like that, they would scrape off the scab and mail them to. Oh. Ah! Are and, there still people who will send uh, uh, baby scabs uh, for, for chicken pox through the mail? Like you could still buy those? I don't know. I think that's probably the most disgusting thing we've ever talked about. No, 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 no. What the hell are you talking about? Oh, you don't know about this? Like, like, no. uh, okay, okay. Did you so know about this, Andrew? The, the, uh, bel- the belief no. is, you know, uh, that, that you should, uh, well, I don't want my kid to get chicken pox as an adult because then it'll be really bad. Let me give him chicken pox as about, a kid. Yeah, chicken pox parties, but yeah. Yeah, okay. Well, this is apparently if you don't have cool friends who happen to have chicken pox around at the time, you can poke <laughs> around on the internet and you can, p- parents... We'll have a kid take a lot who has the chicken pox and slobber on a lollipop, eat it a bit. Then they wrap it up and they put it. I bet I can find one for sale right now. Hold on. I'm going to write here. What? Chicken pox lollipop. I'm sorry. You say goodbye to David Bowie. Chicken pox. It looks like he just had one in that photo. (laughs) Lollipops. And uh, uh, yeah, here we go. Swapping chicken pox infected lollipops is illegal, according to Reuters. What? uh, Not to buy. Buy online. Here we go. Lollipops laced with chicken pox. Uh, <laughs> chicken pox lollipops helpful. for sale at shenos.com. Let me see if this is still good. 
uh, rogue movement claims to boost immunity. Yeah. Well, I see. And I don't know if this is like an overinflated thing where it's like, uh, here, let me, I, I'm going to go to Craigslist. That's where I need to do Craigslist.org. Now, this would it have some sort of disgusting? Now, like, <laughs> here, I'll go to US. I'm going to do a little would search. It, How do I search? Does it have some other kind of maybe alternate name they use for it now? Oh, I bet. Hold on. I can't find. Ooh, yeah. I guess I'll look here in Austin. See what I can find here. Austin. <laughs> Order a few. Up. I need those avian pops. Who's got those avian pops? Avian pops. Mm. Chicken pox. I'm going to type in here. Cluck, cluck pox. Uh, well, there's a 73-inch Mitsubishi TV and two-month-old Pullets Young Hens for sales as chicken pox. Um, dang, I'm going to have to find it. Uh, I'll see if, I'll see if well, I can no, find I one for you. I think you've proven that it is a thing. We like, believe you, like, Brian. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't think that anybody needs to actually have the link to buy one right now. Unless we want to work out an affiliate code with who's ever selling uh, <laughs> chicken pox infected lollipops. In that case, we'll be sure to give you our you know d dial in night attack at checkout so you can get 5% off uh, diseasing your own children in the most perverse and bizarre way possible. Mm. Don't forget the measles M and M's, guys. Those are really good. <laughs> so I mean, like, is this like I, I don't know? I feel like this would be a good uh, a Bonnie conversation if Bonnie was around. Like, like just that idea of like, like where do you need to be as a parent to be like, this is the best idea, is to to disease my own children in that kind of well, way. Well, but, but keep in mind that the same impulse that you would have to do that is the exact same impulse to vaccinate your, your children. Like it's not pleasant to go take your baby and have him stabbed with a needle, yeah. but, but you, Unless you hate your child. You, you accept that, that pain in order to grant them what you perceive to be long-term immunity. So, so same thing only I, I would imagine just, you know, in, in a more traditional old fashioned sense, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, and like, I guess for whatever reason, like the chicken pox party, like idea of like, Oh, look, the, the kids down the block have chicken box. Let's just have them all watch a movie together and, you know, throw some Legos on the ground and let's see if we can get this party started with the chicken box. Like I, for some reason that seems more inoffensive, for, like the, the mail order element of it just totally, um, like, so here we go. This is a porthole posted in 2011, uh, looking for chicken pox. I know there are a few Northwest mommies, who would love the opportunity to expose our little ones to chicken box if given the opportunity. If you if you have them or know of someone willing to share, please post here. That's so weird. Here's one for January 9th, so it's not like uh man, pox parties. <sighs> it it at some point you hope we come up with a, a better way to inoculate <laughs> and we'll go trying to tell, you know, their, our children's children like Oh, you know, like they actually used to intentionally infect you with chicken pox. Well, and I'll tell you, it's it's a little bit more gross to me because I had uh, uh, earlier this year, I guess six months ago, I got I got shingles, which is a resurgence of chicken pox. If you had chicken pox as a kid, you keep the virus in your body forever. And uh, when it resurfaces as an adult, it is miserable. Uh, and uh, uh, having gone through it, I'm I'm not I'm not a big fan of the chicken pox parties. So. Like, but would it have been worse if you had gotten chicken pox for the first time as an adult? Like, I, I don't know. I know that they put me on some heavy duty uh, uh, antivirals, the same thing they put uh, people who have herpes with Valtrex. They, they just hammered me with like triple doses on that stuff to get rid of uh, Here's somebody in it Columbus, just... Ohio. <laughs> I need chicken pox. I was blessed with chicken pox as a child. Uh, yeah, I have a lifetime immunity against the virus, but will manifest as shingles if my immunity to chicken box is not boosted from time to time. If you have a kid with the bug and would be so kind as to visit for a half hour and There's, get what? exposed, I will be ever so grateful. I think just hanging around the general area would suffice. This, Thanks, Bruce. This guy, first of all, Bruce, I think you're, I think you're mistaken on the way that works. I don't think hanging around the disease Boost your uh, a, a child with chicken way, this, pox is unlike, not a recharge the cell. Western mommies contingent that was uh, we, we read earlier that was posted five days ago yes. in the Columbus yes. uh, Craigslist. Craigslist. Oh 
man. We need, uh, I know we got doctors listening. I'd like one of them to chime in. You know, it's been a while since we've solicited emails. Uh, do, do we, do we want to give the, the weird things email or just say, reach out to any of us? Just reach, yeah, reach out, out to any of us. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Subject, weird things. That is bizarre. That is, uh, uh, and, and not to mention, uh, fairly, as people are pointing out in, in the chat realm here, are uh, fairly pedo y. It, that was pedo centric. Yeah, if you have a child. Does your child have chicken pox? If mm. someone in your family has chicken pox, please let me bring my children over to play. We like immunity the old fashioned way. Oh my God. Really? Well, I guess that's the other thing, too, is that, is that my kids got vaccinated. So it's like, why even, why even bother now? So they have like a good vaccine for chicken pox? Like that's like I assume so. I, I don't what... think we vaccinate for chicken pox. Oh, no, yeah. No, 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 no. I'm almost certain that that my kids have been taking chicken pox vaccine. That'd be rad. I mean, that's rad if it's a new thing and we knock yeah, off here all we this go. insanity. Uh it's uh the chicken uh, and, and and I know when we were kids that this didn't exist, but uh Ah, ah okay. That's the... I, I forgot that science advances. <laughs> <laughs> the, <laughs> the varicella vaccine there we go yeah man crazy we just want to excuse us while we all read articles about chicken pox and all pox right, parties yeah, listen, i mean i don't know this is digging this is a tour de force of an episode man like i don't think i've had so much fun uh, immediately dovetailing into like gut-wrenching horror and disgust <laughs> by this like barbaric medieval trading of spit and saliva and weird pedos and Columbus. Yeah. Uh, well, Ugh. at least not since this. Well, that guy, listen, he's actually getting handsomer as we keep showing him this David <laughs> right? Bowie picture. I think really the only thing about that, that, that I find the funniest is the jaunty way he's holding his cigarette. Uh, like a, like a little, um, a mini bee dog. Well, yeah, well, it's just kind of like it's it's like almost an like an impossible angle. Like, why would anybody hold a cigarette like that? All right, what else? What else you got for us, Andrew? I got, I got one more thing, guys. Kind of weird. Not too weird. Kind of interesting. The back and forth. Um, and what's what's sure to be a little bit more controversy as it starts to get more attention, and we love those sort of things. Is the debate on who the first op first Americans were, the first people to come to this continent, has continued. And so, I guess, like, like as I are the real American <laughs> fight for the world. That's right. Uh, the uh, I guess, I guess uh, it's not Columbus, of course, uh, and it's not uh, allegedly the you know Native Americans were there. Are you talking about who discovered it first or who lived here first? First peoples to live here. Okay. All right, so you're not yeah. talking about like the, the whole controversy with the uh, with the Vikings discovering um, America first. Yeah, well, of no course. I mean, we, no, we all know from history that it was the first men who were then defeated by the Andals. Uh, <laughs> they settled uh, the northern land, built the wall, and kept the wildlings on the other side of it. But the children of the forest. Were... Well, the children of the forest are yeah. I mean, they they interacted with the first men. Yeah. Um, so. There was a while ago, there was some debate because, you know, we, we think that there may have been two different migrations along Beringia, along the uh, from Siberia over into the Americas. You know, that's been some debate because we find we think like, oh, this is the earliest point which we think anybody came here. And then we find, you know, some earlier civilization or some little campsite much further down I'm like wow they made it even further there was a period in time in washington they found a body that they thought had maybe potentially european features and then genetic testing showed that he was siberian and squashed sort of that to my understanding um meanwhile on the east coast of the united states and no somebody says in the chat room this is the whole clovis points controversy no tensor guy it's not they found periodically on the East Coast, they found some, they found some spear tips and they found some uh, flints that were very, very European in appearance. And they found these European-style stone tools dating back between 19,000 and 26,000 years at six locations along the U U.S. East Coast in Maryland, in some Delaware, and some other places, uh, and even Pennsylvania. And they've also found some doing dredging, which is kind of interesting. So 
they look at these spear points, these tips, and they realize these are very Euro- these are European style. And spear tips and designs with those sort of signatures, they're very, very telling because, as Brian will tell you, we talked about before, they don't change radically. You pick pick up one up, you figure they had to be trading with these people or had to come in contact. Now they've got some genetic information because you have physical evidence. Now I'm looking at some of the genetic information. They found some DNA markers in uh, – bones of dating back 15,000 years to people who are you know long extinct but who lived in the Americas with de- genetic markers that match Europeans. And so, mm. and you go back for enough time, you had a lot more between the Atlantic that there may have been a pathway from Europe over to the Americas across ice, across ice flows, across solid things. You would have had seals, you would have had a lot of tasty things to eat along the way. And that's the thing is we tend to think about things in a very static like the world looked like it did today. You go back 20,000 years ago, it looked radically different. Coastlines where they found some of these fragments in being dredged up were 60 miles offshore. Now, now when you say uh, – forgive me if I missed it, but, but you, you described uh, physical pieces. You're saying they found genetic material on the, the physical uh, – I don't know. Like, they bones and stuff too when they find – Okay, like, so really, they did really find ancient. bits and pieces of people. Okay. Yeah, they, for instance, like they found like tests on ancient DNA found from an 8,000 year old skeleton in Florida that revealed a high level of a key, probable European originating genetic marker. And there are some isolated North Native American groups whose language appears not to be related in any way to Asian originating American Indian populations. So the, the, the evidence shows that there may be not one, not two, but potentially three migrations and a much, much earlier migration along the Atlantic coast. I mean, uh, first of all, this is important, and it's important that the work happen. But as you listen to it, there's almost this weird, like, sports arena tribalism, like, yeah, Europeans first, or whatever, like, like label. But, like, the farther back you go, the more nonsensical those labels sound. Yeah, I guess the, my, my reaction is that when sometimes when they've been suggesting there was a European, and again, these Europeans are as alien to you and me as... You know, any other people going back 20,000 years ago, they, they look nothing like us, you know. Um, I guess the problem is there has been there has been a, a, a real there when it was suggestion there could have been, you know, European migrations. It was just the reaction to that was no, absolutely not. Not true. Can't happen because it had caused some cultural discord that some people felt like their identity was threatened. If it turned out that there may have been some other first peoples. And we find that Many people who identify with that have rel- share relatively few genes with the first people we know who came over from Siberia. So I guess my point is, is like the debate's not settled. We don't know. And it wouldn't surprise me if we find evidence of this and then we find out that there may have been a 30,000-year-old migration through, you know, Siberia, you know. But I guess my point is that there was just this, this fearful – It was people were sometimes fearful of suggesting, well, maybe Europeans didn't come here. What does that mean? Nothing. It's just historically interesting. Yeah. Like where where does that identification? I mean, is it is it just a, a, a cultural marker that we want to defend and and say like oh well like I am special because I am of something else or or however else we dice up our cultural biases? I, you know for sure, and I think the thing that we're realizing more and more as we start looking at the genetic information is people are not very isolated. The, the genes have been flowing back and forth for thousands of years, and you know you have. Northern European civilizations were getting genes from the Middle East much later on than they, you know, than we acknowledged or realized. That uh, you know, along with culture and other things, that the, you know, the interconnectedness is much stronger than we realize. Yeah, well, like to me, the the moment that that hit home is when you started hearing uh, casually people mentioning, "Oh yeah, no, up to ten percent DNA, Neanderthal DNA." And it's like, are you kidding me? That's not even allegedly the same species. Like, once you've crossed <laughs> that border, how weird is it that 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 someone's great great grandfather had sex with someone else's great great grandmother from you know uh, Asia or South America or, or, oh, or yeah. Australia or wherever? Absolutely. And so I think that, but it, it's a very interesting part in the story, and we have to come to a point where we have to say, okay, what some people may feel culturally threatened by is irrelevant to what's important and understanding the science of how these things work. You know, and there's there's there are some indigenous Native American belief that they started here. Like, let, there, let, there, let me ask you no guys this. How tradition. how important because I, I maybe maybe I'm wrong on this. Now keep in mind I come from a, a background culturally uh from from what we've been able to gather 
Uh, I'm very much like a, you know, a, a blended culture. Uh, I've been told that there's a lot of a lot of English in me, a lot of uh, Norwegian, a lot of uh, e- some some Canadian Indian, some Italian, all, all this stuff where it's like I maybe it's just where I'm from, but I don't understand it when people say, no, it's important we keep our culture alive or keep it preserved or, or whatever. Like, is, is is that important? Like, to me, no. the faster we get to the point where nobody cares where you're from, the better. Uh, but, but, I, but I, I agree. I so, just someone quick, explain to me the opposite side is, I guess, what I, I'm I saying. Just, I just want to do one more quick aside as far as the origins question, because the problem has been is that we've been we've often had roadblocks in trying to do genetic research and certain when we find really, really, really old bodies, because some Native American groups are like, absolutely not. You can't do any research this on whatever. We're going to put a lockdown on it. We don't want to plow it. But they may be no more related to said body than you or I, and right. that gets to be a problem. Is that is that you, when you want to do research, and that's not as maybe as big as a problem I'm making out to be. And and most of most Native American groups are very open to the research and are very interested in considering it a fascinating thing because they know that it doesn't diminish one ounce what cultural and significant contributions they've had. So um, as far as that, like I, I Brian, like I hear what you're saying that the people are like, oh, we got to. Pre- I'm all for preserving language and preserving these things. But not forcing the next generation to do that. I think that that uh, let it let you know let not at the expense of the individual. I mean, I don't even know that I'm for preserving it. I mean, what's the? I mean, uh, I don't know. I say preserve it exactly how we preserve the smallpox virus. <laughs> you know, like let someone job it twice <laughs> exactly. Well, well, and well Brian, well, that's what it. I mean. Is is one is you know let's record it, let's archive it, let's make it widely available. That's how I mean by preserve it. The other thing, too, is I think that there is, in some cultures, there's been this hesitation to teach other people these things. The languages and stuff, the folk songs, is they want to keep it within their own genetic group. When yeah. there might be some kid in Nova Scotia who would love to learn some of these, you know, more obscure songs Pacific Islanders know or whatever. And it's like, listen, you got to give up on one thing. You either got to give up the culture or you got to give up the genes. Well, I, I feel like. In terms of like preserving culture, quote unquote, I mean, like I can understand it as like a marker of our human history and like the story of where your family came from and and understanding that. Uh, I I agree with you, though, Brian, that like if you are taking anything more from that other than like, oh, look, this is what people that were related to me did, uh, then you are doing I, 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 I personally don't quite see the the benefit of it and more troublingly it can tend to be the like coded language of really destructive and and uh negative thought i mean i mean you're getting at tribalism right the whole idea that well, it's or, like yeah, no we got to keep our team in the game of this and and because of this history we are now more naturally predisposed to do x y or z you know like i i think that that's that's frustrating I mean, it's weird because at the one time we're seeing the end of a lot of tribalism where people are less interested about where they're from, but we're seeing the beginnings of other types of tribalism. For example, the community that supports this show, uh, you know, as we call them, Chat Realm, spans all uh, the entire world, you know, all over the world. People, you know, call in and participate from from Scandinavia, from Estonia, from the United States, from South. We have people in South America right now watching and commenting in the chat. And so in one regard, we all give up our biological geographic tribalistic locations, but then we take up ideological tribal, you know, because because there there is sort of unifying themes between, you know, there, there's certainly a, a, a bit of a cult of a personality for the, the kinds of people that people come in on this. I don't know. I think I think I think it's I, I would rather see tribalism based on ideology than than just the the genetic lottery. Yeah, I think that and also, too, it's like, you know, some some tribes or some groups or cultures are very easy to adapt into bigger ones and all that. And, you know, in, in the comment section, there's somebody making a remark about like, I feel like, really, I assume if you're saying if you're white Protestants, whatever, you don't have to worry about preserving your culture. Well, white Protestants came from a very, very large area and many, many different languages, many, many different languages, you know, and there's a number of people who 
I, I know very, very next to nothing about my Scandinavian ancestors. You know, I don't know. I don't speak Swedish. I don't speak Norwegian. I know somewhere my a lot of my relatives popped up in Kentucky, and I know nothing about that. I don't know anything about Kentucky folk songs, Kentucky folk music. There's a whole history of all that there. I have no idea what any of that is. He doesn't even watch Justified. <laughs> like <laughs> He I, hates why? Kentucky <laughs> bourbon. Yeah. <laughs> he know, didn't, he didn't I, even I, vote for Rand Paul. That's uh, no. that's a yeah, fact. Got, and then fried chicken, not even on the top ten <laughs> for favorite foods. I mean, sure, he's heard of 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 uh, Dollywood. Never been there though. <laughs> Tried. I'd like Wait, to that's go. Tennessee. I'm, Never mind. Knows all the lyrics to my old Kentucky home. Yeah. However, <laughs> but but you get the point is it's like that. A lot of that gets lost all the time, and you know you can look forward to look backwards, and and it would be great to preserve that, but not at the expense of an individual not having the choice to make their choose their own destiny. It's it's tough because I know that that part of what draws us together is that we tend to have uh, similar ideas. So this is another no, yeah. one that I would love to <laughs> I would love to hear somebody <laughs> present the other side because I bet somebody well, could could explain it to us. In a I good mean, the, way. the thing about uh, and 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 to defend the cultural argument is that like you can't have that taken away from you. You know, you yeah. can. You can be a certain class and then not that class. You can be a certain ideology and then fall out with the main line of where the, the, your, your peer group kind of thinks. If you are of a certain culture, then that's something that you can always say, I am, I am this. You know, there is, there is I think, almost an, orient, an, an, an orientation point element to it that is helpful. That, you know, like I can now, I know where I am based on where my family has been. I I will give you an example of this, watching this in play. So I, I, I spent the last week at this thing called Adventures of the Mind. They bring 200 high school kids from around the country to a campus. In this case, it was Occidental College, and they bring in a lot of very different, interesting people. We had the author, uh, Amy Tan was there, uh, paleontologist Jack Horner. We had you know, astronauts, Nobel Prize winning physicists, just a great, great collection of people, and then me. And <laughs> We had two two of my favorite speakers, a lot of great speakers. Two of my favorite speakers was, on one hand, uh, we had Ben Ha. He's the guy that does I Can Has Cheeseburger. Mm -hmm. So he's a guy that's just produces tons and tons and tons of this content that takes up a short amount of your time. All these memes, cat memes, all this other stuff. And so he's a guy who's been a, a prolific purveyor of this kind of short attention span content. And then we had James Elroy talk, celebrated crime novelist, the movie uh, – L.A. Confidential, based on his books, he did a lot of stuff in the Black Dahlia murders, etc. This is a guy that doesn't own a cell phone, doesn't have email, and totally says he's plugged. Doesn't plug into any kind of technology. All that writes his novels long form using yellow legal pads. Did a wonderful, wonderful talk where he does his things and speaks as sort of this uh, rhyming sort of pattern and uses all sorts of big fancy words like tumescent. And, you know, <laughs> got these kids and, and nobody, I started cracking up. Nobody knew what he's, you know, you two mess at teenagers. I'm like, that's hilarious. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> nobody doing? around me knew what he meant. Um, none of the adults that I was already immediately around understood. But anyhow, he would, you know, start and he would swear. He would do all this stuff. Great, great speech. But he made this case for like, you know, the, the idea that the long form entertain for long form attention is gone. Long form attention has gone. People just don't read as much. He kind of railed against a lot of modern, the modern, you know, dividing your attention and all these other places. And he has one cultural value that's same group of people, same physical space that we're all in. But he has his idea of what to preserving cultural means. And then Ben Ha talks about the idea that it used to, he uses an example of how it used to be culture was sort of this big, thick, deep dish pizza. Now it's a big, thin crust pizza that's much, much wider. It's the same amount of stuff there, but it's spread all over. And yeah. it was just interesting to see the two different approaches towards that. And it was a cultural war, a cultural discussion. I mean, I don't, uh, uh, first of all, uh, I mean, w sure. Let's say uh, uh, you, you say, I'm, I'm going to use, you know, the whatever you, the universal you say you. that uh, that long form content you. is dying. Yeah, exactly. Uh, I, but, but, but to me, it's like, so what? Uh, we have a more efficient mode of communication. Clearly, um, you know, to me, what's so great about the fact that you wrote longhand, that just means you wrote fewer novels and, uh, you know, and, and they're, they're in, in your life. Like we're only, you know, we're, we're, we're mayflies. We get one day on this stupid planet and, and let's do more efficient modes of communication. I will play the devil's advocate. Okay. And, and I am with you. I think whatever you choose to choose. And I also make the argument long form isn't dying. Children's novels keep getting thicker and thicker and thicker. Um, I bet you Penny has read more books this year than I have. That she were read. Than she read all 
all of the Harry Potter series in two weeks. Like that is that is she is ten years old and 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 just came back with a vengeance on it. Now she's started uh, the Dark Materials series. I mean, she has read so much and it's like I don't know. Don't weep for the youth. They're smarter yeah, so than we I, are already. I'll say this like. There is, there's the fear of what we might be missing. There's the fear of like, you know, we know now that people who take notes, actually handwritten notes, have much higher retention than people who try to do notes electronically. That there's, that's one of the problems. You know, people often have trouble remembering the titles of books that they read on Kindles versus actual physical books because once you get past that first page, you never encounter the title or the author again unless you look up above, you know. That can be that. And so the, there's the fear of what we might be missing. There's the fear that, is there something to be gained in spending 500 words with an author and living in that universe and not having your attention pulled out of it that you're going to have a much more complete thought or experience? Justin. I agree. I mean, I, I think the only thing that we, that we don't, uh, like, I, I would, in this conversation about tribalism, like, I don't want to go too hard on, you know, like, well, and that's why he's wrong, because we're internet people, and we're right, and we do digital things. Yeah, down with the Luddite tribe! Yeah. Boo! We're here on the internet tribe. We don't have tribalism, unlike those assholes who yes. write on paper. Um, yeah. So, like, I, I think I, I tend to, obviously, spend my entire time plugged, my entire day plugged in on some level and and I believe that my life is infinitely better for it and and it is like I, I can list the reasons why I think it is awesome but if somebody like doesn't see that then like all right man like it's just like your opinion right well but 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 even then like like the case against it and this is something uh, that I read in uh, trust me I'm lying uh, where the guy uh, number one tells the story of how he became successful by uh, manipulating the right now culture of the blogosphere and and the insatiable demand to come up with you know seven to twelve stories per day in order to to keep the lights on. Uh, and he spends the last half of the book lamenting the fact that somehow like we're worse off for it. And and he makes points of people who you know get excoriated uh, unfairly because something blows up or whatever. But I would say that that while there you could certainly point to individual moments of of um, inefficiency where somebody gets, you know, just hammered. But you've always been able to see that we still uh, know Richard Jewell as the Atlanta Olympic bomber, even though he was 100 percent exonerated over that. This is before the blogosphere. This is before any of that crap. This was uh, the only thing different is instead of a, a constant, you know, 10 minute news cycle, there was a 24 hour news cycle. And it, it, the impulse for us to overstate, to sensationalize it, to blow up has always been extremely human. The oh. only thing that's changed is the iterative pace that it's happening and, now. And I'll add in like a great example that was made, again, Mr. Hodden we talked about was that like I, I've always hated science editors, always hated science editors because they would cover a topic, they would go for the most sensational thing they could yep. and then move on and never revisit it when it was refuted or whatever. And I used to write letters and, and be ignored because they didn't care. Now through blogging, now you can talk about like, you know, the Mars Curiosity, pro you know, hey, it just launched. A couple of weeks later, hey, we just had the successful deployment of this part of it. Boom, hey, it's on its way. And then later on, they pick up the story of it landing, and you have these stories that continue on throughout. Now, traditional old form journalism, they might have like a 500, 800 word piece on it, and then they would move away from it. But here you have a much, you have, if you follow, if you just look at this one bit, like, oh, that's not much, but you follow this thread straight across, you get a much more comprehensive story because we want to come back to it, and you can oh. have all sides of it. I mean, from from having worked in print journalism newsrooms, like, what would you rather have this infinite uh, stream of small articles or a news hole of in a major metropolitan news section? You're probably looking at 10, maybe 10 to 14 uh, original articles. And then you take the rest from the wire, which is even more dangerous because it's you know, something, down. someone gets something wrong. It's just reprinted throughout, you know, uh, off the AP or Getty or, or UPI or something like that. So it's uh, it, in my mind, it's like, yeah, listen, what, what the Internet has done is given us a great, a, a far greater and detailed look of how these things happen and why they happen and the points in which there are failures. And now 
with their, you know, yeah, it's violent to watch the process in motion, you know, when somebody screws something up and then it just gets really, really ugly, really, really fast. But well, that, uh, it's it, 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 it's always gone on it. Uh, and, and I'll tell you what, what you're talking about is a side effect of of this culture of uh, heterogeneity that we have, you know, where it's like um, uh, the Internet is a very fast moving. And I'm going to say the Internet, but I'm talking about the whole, you know, 24 hour blogosphere culture where, you know, there's there's bite sides things that can explode on the Internet side. Uh, it is a volatile market of ideas. There's big swings up and down. But in general, uh, one of the side effects has been the fact that there's no need to, uh, I'm not going to say there's no need, but we've seen a massive decrease in the dumbing down of science as it's presented to the mass culture. Uh, back in the day, like you were saying, you had to pick one of three stories from the from the wire in order to figure out what you're going to put on. You're going to do whatever has the biggest appeal that you're not worried about losing people on. Uh, nowadays, we don't have to worry about that. Somebody, for every one blogger that decides he's going to play it safe and make it palatable for the massives, some other blogger is going to give the hard numbers and explain to you the, you know, I don't, you know, the the the, the physics behind it. That uh, it's going to be a much more dense article, and I feel like mankind is winning as a result universally because. We uh, again, it's it's iterative. We get more iterations. We get more well, at bats for important ideas but, and, because and, and who, of the speed. Who wins are the people who want to go deeper. Yeah, you know, because there was there is still the same stupid article that would have been run in a major metropolitan paper on Elite Daily uh, above uh, the ten freeze frames from Orange Is the New Black that you absolutely must see and why I've started dating women instead of girls. Like you know, like there that is still there. Yeah. But what's different is that if in the one person in the comment that's like clickbait, stupid, this is why it's wrong, there is now a thread that you can follow. And also, that dumb article is more, we think of it as something that would go up on a BuzzFeed or one of the, the, the Facebook things and not the only name in news that you would previously be able to read. Yeah. It's like your daily paper or, or you know, like the, the media as media has grown, like at least dumb stuff, although still popular and still will always be read by a certain element uh, of, of society that just doesn't want to take the time and fine, whatever. They might want to focus on other stuff. But if you care to do it, you are able to go. So, so tell that, me this, that's what's uh, and, and I want to get both uh, Andrea and Justin on this. And I know we're about to wrap up here, but uh, but it seems to me that the flip side of this, the counter argument is that uh, that it used to be that you had to have public discourse and you had to read the other side of the story because there was only one newspaper in your town. So you had to read it and, and understand other people's ideas. Whereas nowadays you could spend all day watching MSNBC, Fox News, insert whatever, uh, and, and live in your own silly bubble. Like, uh, uh, do you feel like the increased ability to shape the feed of the input to your own news brain is, is, I mean, I, I don't, I, I understand the words of the argument, but I don't believe a single word of it. Do you feel like there's any downside to the ability to wrap yourself in a bubble uh, for all of mankind? I, I think that it's harder to be in that bubble now. I think it's much harder to stay in that bubble. Um, but I think if you, if you want the bubble, you'll, you can choose the bubble. You always could choose the bubble. I, you know, I meet, you meet people who are, it's interesting. You talk to people who like who left the Church of Scientology, okay, who were involved in Sea Org or involved in those levels, and and they talk about things. And I remember talking to one guy. Talked about like he said, yeah, I said, like I knew who Clinton he was. He was involved when Clinton was president. Like because I knew Clinton vaguely was president, but I didn't know anything about it. Didn't wow. care. And and you find out a lot of these people just are totally, totally. I guess the word right word is ignorant of politics or the world around them. And I've met people. I remember talking to a guy, really, really successful businessman. Real estate, all that, multi multimillionaire. Didn't know who Larry King was. Wow. And I'm like, Larry, Larry King, this guy's been around for since Moses. No yeah. idea who he was. It was not in his role, didn't care, didn't involve with any of the business he was involved with, and it was completely immune to that. So you know, and that was that was a discussion with somebody fifteen years ago. So I mean, my, my guess is like, I understand how for one person, it could be a tragedy that this one person is wrapped in the bubble instead of trying to understand all lives uh, or all sides. But I feel like allowing the existence of those bubbles for those people to wrap themselves in 
in general is part of a general culture of again heterogeneity that that I think is benefiting man pretty well because on the fringes yeah. you do have people looking at both sides. But I think that, I think most people are in bubbles though. I mean I think that it's it's that it's that you know when somebody gets angry listening to some other side or some other aspect of it and and upsets them it's because they're so far off on their own sort of sin. They, they're so into their own sort of tribe or their own way of thinking that they're totally oblivious to how they're in a bubble. And that's why, you know, you know, people who I think are a little more open to what all those are, don't get upset. You know, you can watch anything, either whatever. But I think people who get who have the strongest allergic reaction to this, it's because their immune system is much more weaker than they realize. And they, they're and they're probably much more in a bubble than they want to acknowledge. And. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know how much more I can say that Andrew hasn't said more eloquently, but like the the idea of the, these confirmation biases, like they're, they've been there. They've been there forever. There's more that we can, there's more different content that caters to every element of it, but uh, I, I don't really know where it's different than just not paying attention to stuff if you don't like what is being said to you, you know, which was like the previous way to keep yourself in a bubble is just to busy yourself doing other stuff. It's like before there were internet message boards and before there was, you know, uh, you know, twitchy or, or you know, think progress or whatever you want to, you know, uh, align yourself with and whatever shirt you want to put on and yell about how the other shirts are dumb. Like mm -hmm. that's, there was you could just go and not pay attention to the news because you thought that they were run by people that you didn't agree with. And you could just you could still get magazines or you could get a leaflet or you could scratch on the same rock that all your friends scratched on. Like whatever. It's always been there. It's just now it's just a uh, colorful and fun and it it, it boosts your clout score. <laughs> Gentlemen, time for picks. Boom. Uh, I'll tell you what I'm reading right now. I don't know if this is a pick. Um, it's it's been uh, I I've enjoyed it. It's been a little tedious in that um, it's it's a overbroad story, so that um, as a result, there's a lot of things that that I had run across peripherally before. But it's all correlated into a very cogent narrative uh, that tells the story of the human body, and it's called the story of the human body by Daniel E. Lieberman. And it talks about uh, uh, our relatives, of, uh, you know, uh, 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 from archaeologically speaking, or, or uh, what's the, what's the what, that's not the word you say. Uh, what, what is it? Anthropologically, there you go. Anthropologically. Um, wow, I can't talk. Uh, at any rate, um, I'm enjoying it. Uh, I'm almost done with it. It makes some good cases uh, and uh, talks. It dips a little bit into the unsettled science of how much of what we do day to day is what our bodies have evolved to do and is the trade-off uh worth it you know uh whether it's you know talking about uh nowadays what we do is if you have uh flat feet then they make sure to give you uh orthotic shoes to support your flat feet but in that case you never strengthen your arch so you have flat feet forever and uh whereas historically there's a whole movement of uh runners who run barefoot and and virtually none of them have flat feet because they're treating their feet the way they're they're evolved to do however Doing things the way you're evolved to do isn't necessarily better either because, uh, you know, you're, you're built to live until about 35 and then drop dead from malaria or whatever. So um, it, it, I, I think it gives a, a fairly balanced uh, uh, explanation. Um, and, of course, I'm talking about the modern aspect of things because that's what the last third of the book focuses on. But the first uh, it talks a lot about the, uh, the uh, artifacts that we have from the early days of trading and – uh, we talked last uh, last week or the week before about the hand axes that people were making and so on. It's good stuff. Yeah, it, it's it's real quick. It, it's interesting because like there was a much much bigger like ah you know run run without shoes you're meant to do that kind of thing and then after a number of people started doing that for a while and were getting tremendous amounts of injuries and realizing that you know unless you're doing it since you're from childbirth and built up the really thick thing in your skin it's it's not a good idea. Well, and he also shoes says shoes have been. Yeah. And, and, uh, and, uh, uh, I believe the counter argument and again, he doesn't really have a dog in the fight. He just reports yeah, like that, yeah. what, what each side says, you know, people say that like, like with shoes, uh, when there are injuries, they tend to be bigger injuries because, um, uh, you know, because I don't know for reasons because parts of you get weaker or whatever, but he does make the sensible argument and he even gets into the whole, um, uh, you know, whether or not reading too much 
causes myopia and and uh, and I don't know enough about about it at all but you know he points out that uh, you know uh, the worst case scenario maybe it's okay to uh, have your kids experience sight in more ways than just three feet in front of their face uh, that on there but at any rate I, I would love for some scientist the way he represents it is that it's debated but but I don't know if that's the case that's easy for somebody to, to, to weasel in what might end up being a pseudoscientific idea in there. Mm, well, there was my chance. <laughs> um, I'm going to show you another pick. Is it a pop-up book? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Remember how last time I showed you guys the... Uh... I love how this is rapidly becoming Uncle Andrew's pop-up time. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh dude. Well, eventually, it's going to be the whole show. <laughs> He's off camera right now, off retrieving. Remember we had the science pop up, the amazing science. Now this beyond is beyond amazing. amazing. Yeah. yeah, beyond did amazing. Did I show you this one with the hourglass? You did, you did. Yeah. A functioning hourglass that you could put in there? Well, now I got the other missing parts too. I got a complete one, which includes... Oh, what's that? I'm looking at you guys. Oh I'm seeing gosh. you. Freaking binoculars, that's amazing. <laughs> Pop open binoculars, right, 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 and move past there. You know, maybe, maybe I want to talk to somebody, and maybe I put take this little pop open sort of construction, take the little wire to it, and attach it to the other pop open one, and I have a little telephone. I'm like, hey, what's going on, guys? Wow. Good to hear from you. What? Yeah, no, yeah, she's coming over right now. That's right. So don't even bother to come by. Just talk on the door. So seriously, right? don't let her see. Don't let us see the two of us uh, talking into tin yeah. can telephones. I don't think you appreciate this technology. I can actually send sound information to somebody across distances with it. It's amazing. Yeah. Um, so anyhow, this is another one of these really cool books. And again. This is the beyond amazing. If you're looking, if you have a kid who's into science or you have a child like Glee yourself, beyond amazing, six spectacular science pop ups. You can get it for like a dollar plus shipping on Amazon for if you buy it used. Uh, you got to be careful because some of them are missing parts, but this one doesn't. I brought these and I brought one of these in my Game of Thrones pop up to do one of my talks this week, and the kids loved it because I talk about like if you're going to want to. When you're trying to build things for, let's say, disaster relief, space exploration, or doing scientific research in hard-to-reach places, building small things that pop open and serve a good purpose are very, very useful. Well, so. and it's, it's funny how the limitations are what the makes... hardcover the, from one cent. Wow. Yeah. Uh, it's amazing That's because amazing. this is a case where you have very strict limitations, but those limitations are what allow you to come up with you know, yeah. these incredible inventive solutions. I'll show you. This is just more of a fun one. This is a. Uh, this one has a. This is the uh, space station pop-up alien space station. You open it up and actually has like little aliens and ships and stuff. You have these little pop-open ships that you can let's see if I can pop open, and so they're pretty cool. But the real fun part is the playset that emerges from here. And as far as a kind of an awesome media, I need gentlemen, I need you to step back for your monitors. I don't want you to get hurt. Uh oh. <laughs> Boom. Holy ah! crap. Jeez. That is extraordinary. So for audio listeners, which is most of you, I've just made a giant, humongous city. Probably, of yeah, it's like a big, huge space station that is, you know, two and a half feet across, two feet tall. It's got platforms, all sorts of little walkways. There are little alien dudes there in different locations. It's uh, it's humongous, and so the book you, you fold all the pages out like that. These are one of my favorite kinds of pop up books where you just flip all the page, you flip it around, and it pops open or something. Yeah. So yeah. I have to get. I'm like about five feet back from the camera in order for you to see the whole thing. That is amazing, dude. That's insane. Right on. What about you, Justin? What are you doing? Uh, we've had such an amazing conversation today about uh, the, the, the trials, tribulations, and treasures of other cultures. Uh, we have railed against uh, the fruitlessness of tribalism, which is why uh, I want to remind everybody that this comes from 
the United States of America, where the World Cup is about to be won by the United States soccer team. Woo! USA! USA! Does, USA! Does, he, does the U.S. actually have a chance? Is it looking good? So Yeah, no, the, I've been watching a lot of the World Cup, uh, which has been a, a really, really good job uh, of, of presenting it by, by ESPN and, and ABC. But uh, they play right after we're done recording, uh, 3 p.m. Pacific time, 6 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, the U.S. plays Portugal for a chance to advance out of the group stage. It would be a big, fun thing. But, you know, it, it's one of those things where I'm not a huge soccer fan. I really don't like it all that much uh, and, and to, to watch it in general. But uh, the World Cup's always, like, it's so well shot. It, it, you know, it's like the top level of of talent that it, it's hard not to just kind of get sucked into it. There's a really good Freakonomics episode that just came out last week talking about uh, why the U.S. doesn't seem to ever care about the World Cup. And it explained uh, why the World Cup is so much bigger and why the U.S. can't bust through it. You know, we have homegrown sports like baseball. And when our team wins the World Series, we proclaim our team from our league only competing against other Americans as the world champions or whatever. But, you know, it, it's sort of an empty boast since so few of the world plays baseball. However, out of all the games, you know, uh, football uh, is is the number one sport. And, uh, you know, with that the case, you know, it's 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 no it's no wonder that the U.S. has a hard time to really dominate because it's not a, car, a, a sport that we care a lot about. Ah, I will. The Toronto Blue Jays would disagree with that. State. Okay. All right. Fair enough. Fair enough. <laughs> Two, touche, sir. But, but so, certainly continental wise or whatever. But uh, but it's really good. If you want to listen to kind of the math of why the U.S. never seems to care or do well at, at soccer or football, uh, I highly recommend it. Well, this is, uh, you know, this this the last 20 years now uh, that the United States as an organization, like the, the United States national team as an organization has uh really tried you know like they've, they've tried to make strides and and uh the team has run in a lot different uh way now pretty much ever since we got the world cup in 94 that was the the first time that uh that we really uh that, that we really uh, you know kind of uh, cared about it in, in a big way and we haven't really stopped but now we we got about as good of a team as we've ever had we have a coach that is considered to be world renowned so We'll see what we can do. Uh, another side pick, which is an anniversary that just passed um, June 17th, 1994, uh, is an amazing documentary. I don't know if you guys can find if it's still on Netflix, uh, but it is exceptional. It was uh, for the ESPN 30 for 30 series. It's a documentary with no narrators at all. There's no talking heads. There's no narration. It is just as if you were flipping through the channels uh, on June 17th, 1994, it was uh, O.J. Simpson, the, the famous white uh, Ford Bronco chase. Uh, the, the, uh, the Knicks were playing the, against... Uh, uh, yeah, against the Rockets, because I remember I, Rockets, I lived in Houston the, watching the that. The Rangers had just won the Stanley Cup and were doing their ticker tape parade. Uh, it is... It, it, Jack you know, Nicholas's I, I last people are like game. Listening to this, and they're like, this is so boring just to listen to what you are talking about. But like... If you enjoy documentaries, you need to watch it. It is so unique and so compelling. This is one of those documentaries that Justin made me watch, and I'm so glad I did. Like, I'm not naturally a sports person, but I remember that day, and it was amazing watching it recreated. And uh, there's if there's one takeaway, man, OJ looked guilty as hell. <laughs> <laughs> man, did OJ look guilty? Holy uh, I, uh, I remember watching that with a buddy, and we were hungry. And again, it's 1994. Right. Yeah. We're hungry and we want to go get something to eat. So what do we do? I get out my battery powered television. OK, we drive with it over to Miami subs, sit it on the counter and eat our sandwiches and watch the chase as it unfolds. And people are walking in. They're like, what? Are you? Oh, that's cool. They gathered around to go watch this little black and white battery operated TV because we're like, this is amazing. And. You know, now that just seems so trivial and silly because, you know, pull out your phone. But that's what I had to do is to carry this big black and white TV, you know. That's amazing. Yeah, that was it's it's so you it's so unique uh, to 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 watch, you know, and and also they do a great job of showing a lot of the unaired uh, broadcast footage like of like Bob Costas, who is uh, announcing that the next game 
like getting the feed into his ear of what is happening in the OJ Simpson uh, as he has to explain to all of the Houston Rockets and Knicks fans that they're going to stop showing this finals game in order to show them, you know, a car driving down the street. Yeah. Or like that's going to be the half. I think it was that was like the halftime show was they went to the fallout from all that. Uh, It is. Yeah, no, it's 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 awesome. It's so good. Uh, Fun little bit of trivia. Um, And this didn't really make big news. Do you know what O.J. Simpson, O.J. Simpson was actually on the board of directors of a very well-known brand and company, and it never really got out. And I. I, um, uh, uh, what, Hertz? Swiss Army Knife. (laughs) Woo! I have a friend that ended up getting his board seat. He said, yes, I took a seat. So, yeah, they were, they were very glad that that was not really brought to attention that he was sitting (laughs) on the board of Swiss Army. Wow. Fun times. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been weird. It's weird. Very there weird. There we go. <laughs> go so ahead. weird. Very weird. It's awfully weird, if you ask me. Awfully weird to you. A lot of weirdness going around. Um, yeah, I don't know. Seems a little bit. 14.06.22. Uh, what are we calling this? Uh, uh, Rock Goblin. Rock Goblin? Yes. Rock Goblin! But it wasn't a goblin. It was a rock star! Rock star. Oh, my gosh. Uh, okay, so I'm copying this beeswax over. Uh, I think I, I, I got to check in with the family, but I, I was going to try to play through. Maybe I'll do that while you're watching the World Cup, Justin. Uh, I was going to play through the third episode of season two of The Walking Dead. Um, looks like a jailbreak episode, basically. I don't know if nice. I have time to do that. But, um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't talk about it cause I'd already talked about it before, but I finished uh Wolfenstein last night and geez, Louise, I've never been more pleased and infuriated simultaneously by a video game ever. It was really difficult for me. Really? Like, yeah. like the mechanics of it? Uh, well, no, no, I mean, the mechanics were fine. The storytelling was great. The character actors were awesome. The cinematography was great. The graphics were beautiful. Everything about it was great except for. Uh, whatever ass hat uh, uh, play tested the damn thing. Uh, forgot that it's important that you not save to do one thing and then secretly have the level only work if you do something else. Like there was like five or six instances where I full on wasted 30 minutes to an hour because the instructions clearly told me to do one thing or the characters told me to do one thing or the level design looked like it wanted me to do something. And I just wasted time because it didn't give any of those cues as i as i talked about last night um you know the problem with video games is that your primary actor doesn't know his lines and he doesn't know what marks to hit and so it's important that you give subtle clues to let him figure out what he's supposed to do and and i feel like they just just miserably drop the ball repeatedly on a bunch of this stuff for that one uh yeah. Stinks. what can you do but is that like them trying to get it out like too fast or I don't think it is because I've seen I've seen what a rushed game looks like. And usually there's like bugs, bugs. And I only encountered like one real bug. Everything else was like institutionally bad storytelling, uh, which which really was a bummer. Um, disk station, weird things. Boop, boop, boop. All right. So I'm going to upload this and then we'll uh, we'll be good. Ah, oh, shit. There's kids crying downstairs. I got to run. Uh, all right, guys. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to shut off the, uh, the live stream. I hope for those of you guys who watched it on MetaCDN, it looked good. Yeah, we uh, need to figure out how to get that on, on Diamond Club, right? Yeah, and, and Colleen has told me she'll uh, hop on and, and, uh, and explain all that to me. But I don't know how much more time I'm going to have. Uh, you're going to be here one week from today, right? I will, yeah. That is a thing. 
Okay. So hopefully we can have it figured out before then. And then I've, I've got to go vacation eight. Uh, Brussels said it looked great. So good. Uh, all right, gentlemen, I'm going to hang up on you and I'll shut down the feed. See ya. Bye. Bye. Waiting on the music to load. Not sure why it's taking so long. Maybe something wrong with the disc. There we go. So long, guys. <laughs>